Joe, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I'm really grateful for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Before we kick everything off, do you mind just giving us a, a brief background on yourself? How did you get into hoops? Uh, where you're from? And then how did you make the transition into coaching? Yeah, I'm from originally Johnson, Rhode Island, just outside of uh, Providence, uh, about an hour of where I live now here in Boston. And I just grew up around the game. Uh, my father was a player in college at Bryant University, played overseas. Uh, my family, you know, my aunts, uncles, everybody played the game. And so my dad was a coach, coached high school. And so I was always around the game, uh, fell in love with it, was able to play in high school, went to college at West Virginia. And, you know, I think the thing that I credit the most is I was always around good coaches. Whether it was my dad, whether it was CYO, whether it was middle school, high school, college, and even the coaches that I worked for, I was always around good coaches and I saw the impact they were able to have uh, on the game and off the court. And, you know, when I was done playing, I, I obviously wanted to stay around basketball and I thought coaching was the best opportunity for me to stay close to basketball, uh, to implement everything that I had learned from all the great coaches I had played for and worked for and to just have a positive impact on, on people. Well, you've definitely played for some very accomplished coaches. Is there anything in common that you see between the coaches, the, the coaches that you played for? Yeah, I mean, Coach Beeline, uh, Coach Huggins are the two ones that stick out. Um, you know, they're very similar in the sense of they teach the game, uh, the things that they focus on, whether it's in practice uh, or whether it's in the game. Uh, I think they have different communication styles. And so, you know, the biggest thing I learned was there isn't one way to coach. There isn't one way to do something. Uh, you got to be adaptable in how you coach. And, and you may have to coach your team different from year to year based on, you know, where they're at as a team, where the individuals are at, uh, and kind of what the expectations are. And so, you know, I've, the one thing I've seen from coaches is they focus on the fundamentals. Uh, they change their level of motivation and their level of communication to their environment. Um, and they care about they care about you more uh, than just being a basketball player. Right. And on top of the coaches that you just mentioned um, in West Virginia and Coach Beeline, who who are some other coaches that really um, guided you along the way to get to where you are today? My high school coach, Jamal Gomes, was um, impactful. You know, he really taught me how to care about people off the court. And, you know, he met with me once or twice a week in his office, just talking about life, family, uh, anything outside of basketball. His ability to teach the fundamentals uh, were great. Uh, I remember my AAU coach, uh, Dave Vitale for the Rhode Island Breakers. He was just great on empowering you uh, as a player. He, he, he constantly reminded you of, you know, why you were on the team, uh, what your purpose was as a player, and how impactful you can be as a player. And so it wasn't just Coach Beeline and Huggins, it was them and um, you know, like I said, the coaches that I worked for as well, that just opened my eyes to different ways you can be impactful as a coach. Mm. And because you played at such a high level did, at, during your playing career, do you have an idea kind of early on that it's something that you eventually wanted to get into? Or did you find out kind of at the end of your playing career? My junior year, I redshirted because I had a shoulder injury and had surgery. And during that time, you know, I sat out that season. I was able to see the game from a different perspective because I wasn't playing. Um, you know, so Coach Huggins did a great job, which I'm grateful for, allowing me to, you know, help with practice plans from time to time, be in some of the meetings and help with scouting. And I just saw the game from a different view. And when I got, when I went back to playing the following year, the game really slowed down for me. So that was kind of when I really um, decided that, you know, coaching was an opportunity for me and something that I thought I could be good at. Now, you've coached at a number of different levels. Um, and, and what age did you first start off coaching? Um, because I know that you, yeah. 22, right when, I, right when I graduated college. Okay. How has your, let's, let's talk about philosophy first. Let's, how has your philosophy changed from where it is today to kind of where you started off? Yeah, I mean, I think when I first graduated, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and um I felt like I was more trying to be the coaches that I had played for instead of mm -hmm. being myself. And, you know, not that I should have even known what, who I was, Joe Mazzullo, the coach yet. So I think the first thing was just creating an identity. Like, who am I going to be? Who's Joe Mazzullo, the coach? Mm -hmm. uh, how is he going to teach? What are his philosophies? And not necessarily, okay, I'm going to do it the way Coach Beeline did, or I'm going to do it the way Coach Huggins did it. 
And so it took me a little while to develop an identity of who I was, what I stood for, what was important to me, and how I was going to separate myself as a coach. And I think that that took a little bit of time. But then I also think once you do that, it's constantly changing and evolving, depending upon, you know, what level you're at, who you're coaching, and you know, what your goals and expectations are. Right. And so not only your philosophy, but how has your style kind of changed in terms of when you're younger? Was it very, were you talking a lot? Was it higher in energy? And then was it a little bit different afterwards with more experience? How's it, how, has it changed at all like that? I mean, I think the first key was getting rid of my player identity. And so it's a, it's a hard dynamic going from playing to coaching. Yeah. When you're a player, it's all about you. Everybody's focused on the player. Everyone's focused on how to make him better. What are your needs on the court and off the court? When you become a coach, it's not about you. And so my first couple of years as a coach, I was still acting like a player in the sense of, you know, constantly talking about myself. How can I, you know, pulling from my playing experiences? Um, why can't the players do it the way I did it? Why can't we do it the way we did it at West Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. And so once you're able to take a step back and, and realize it's not about you, it's about, you know, the, the people you're working with, the people you're coaching, I think it creates a little bit of an easier avenue for you to teach and to coach. And that was a, that was huge for me, especially in my first few years of coaching, uh, trying to shake off the the former player identity. Mm. And since you've been, I mean, you have a wide variety of experience at different levels and you, you've, all, you've coached in college as well. That's, um, is that right? Yeah. D2. Um, yeah. D2 in college. Perfect. So what would be the major differences of coaching at the collegiate level and coaching at the level that you're at right now? You know, there's more similarities than differences. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot more. The similarities lie into you're teaching the fundamentals, uh, you're teaching the mental side of the game, how you're handling the ups and downs, how you're handling the position that you're in. Uh, being a rookie is the same as being a freshman. Uh, players coming off of injuries. Uh, heading into your senior year is similar to being in a contract year. Um, so there's a lot of similarities and and then there are differences. I think the difference is that this is a job for them. And so the expectations are different. The communication is different. Um, and I don't want to say that they're, they're just more advanced players because it's the only thing that they have to do and they've done it for a long, long time and they're very talented. Uh, but I try to focus more on the similarities between the two because I think at the end of the day, you're building relationships you're teaching basketball and you're helping people, you know, build awareness to the situations that they're in and, and how can they be effective in those situations. And I think obviously you're definitely teaching fundamentals. I think it would surprise a lot of people um, because they feel like the NBA is at a different level and maybe that all their learning is advanced stuff. But can you talk about still at the same time, hammering on the fundamentals on a daily basis even though you're working with some of the best players in the world. Yeah, man, I think it comes down to habits. You know, how I think success is just a, a culmination of small habits. And so things that we're constantly talking about, whether it's, you know, offense or defense, footwork, positioning, angles, uh, doing your work early, uh, what it's like to be a professional, showing up on time, you know, how can you separate yourself in your diet? Um, you know, what's your pre-practice workout what's your post-practice workout so all that stuff you're having the same conversations uh in college and, and sometimes in high school and so i think it's focusing on those how can you master those fundamentals in different areas of the game you know to help you be successful now i first heard about you um from doug lamov's book um the teaching guide for coaches i hope i got that right um, the, uh, I think it's coach's guide to teaching. But coach's guide to teaching. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that's where I first found out about you. And you're obviously a big proponent of teaching methods for coaches. As coaches, what can we learn from teachers? I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot. I mean, that's an open-ended question. There's so many things. Mm. But you know, reading Doug's book, uh, and he has a couple of them. You know, my first year as a head coach is when I realized that I didn't know how to teach as well as I thought I did. And that's because as a head coach, you're, you're planning practices, you're developing offense and defensive identities, you're developing a player development program. And so when you have all these systems that you need to have, uh, to which I now see them as systems, whereas before I just thought they were things that you did. Uh, so Doug's book and, and, and learning from teachers is like, how do you build systems? How do you build curriculums? 
Uh, how do you build feedback loops? How do you build retrieval? How do you help players learn? And when they're able to learn, how do you help them to, you know, retain that learning and then grow from that? And the biggest thing is, you know, you can teach motivation. And I think that's something that, you know, I didn't really know as a coach early on. And sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around, but I think you can help players become motivated through your teaching tactics. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think more coaches would definitely want to be able to teach motivation. To, I mean, I would really love to do that. Can you talk a little bit more about teaching motivation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, I think people are motivated when they feel like it's something that can help them uh, or they feel like they're getting better or they feel like they're growing. And so if you can, you know, have your coaching philosophy be around teaching and how can you make, how can you get a player to feel like he's getting better? How can you get, a player to feel like he's being taught something and it's, it's having, it's getting paid dividends. I think that can really open up your classroom, um, you know, for, to, to promote independent learning, to promote, um, you know, guys, you know, as we always want guys to do things on their own and become self-sufficient. I think you do that through the early stages of your teaching. Um, so I think all that kind of plays into it. You know, look, thinking about my, practice plans some i mean there's so many different parts of the game so many different concepts that you want to be able to teach i feel like at least for me one of the things that i do that i can improve on is teaching too much right like i want and I, it's just because i want the best for my players and i want them to be able to hammer on all aspects of the game but at the same time when i first started off i feel like they're getting a little like a lot of nothing where if i narrowed it down and talk about one or two concepts they'd really be able to hammer that home can you relate to that at all like the, the, the coaches the, the coaches that you talk to can you talk a little bit about that and can you give me some advice on like what would you do if you were in my position and you know that you have a problem of teaching too much I mean I'm in your position so any advice I give you I'd be given to myself um, I find it you know difficult for me as a coach to also how, how simple can you be and that's something that you know, working for Coach Stevens, working for Coach Udoka, those two both have helped me, you know, how can you, less is more, how can you be simple, how can you, and I think that's really what separates great coaches and great teachers, is like, how can you take these complex ideas and turn them into the most simplest form? Um, so, like I said, I'd be giving myself the same advice I'm giving you, I'm in the process of trying to learn that all the time, um, because you, you want to, sep- you want to know, you want to gain as much knowledge as you can, you want to, have all this stuff so that you can be well-rounded but at the same time if you're not able to teach it then it doesn't really matter uh if you're if you have it and so that's kind of where I'm at as a coach too is like how can I systemize how, how can I systemize my knowledge how can I make it simple and then how can I teach it effectively uh is always something I'm working on and so I, and I think it comes down to you know keeping it simple having a system how do you build systems how do you build a curriculum and then you know how do you teach it so could you give me an example in terms of say, like we're gonna we're, we're doing an individual skill work session versus the team is practicing together. Would if you had an hour and a half or two or how however many hours you guys practice, would you only go over say like this is how we're gonna run this transition? Like today, this is how we're gonna run this transition, and this is how out of our offense is how we're gonna get back in the transition defense. And versus what you would do with an individual player, like maybe today we're only working on finishing or we're only working on transition shots. What can you give me an idea of how what that would look like? It, would the entire session just be based off one thing? Uh, so we can go through a team first, and I think there's two things you got to know. There's there's massed practice, which and then there's distributed practice. So mass practice is you're introducing something new, you're trying to get things down, uh, you're trying to build a system, um, you're trying to introduce concepts. And in that mass practice, I think it has to be short and it has to be intense. And when you're in these mass practices that are short and intense, you're focusing on two or three concepts, um, maybe less, maybe one or two concepts that you want your guys um, to take from. And so once you're able to do that, you stay in that mass practice until it becomes habitual, you know, and you can take something to the effect of you know, transition offense. If you say, okay, in transition offense, we're running to these five spots. You got to continue to practice that in different ways until it becomes a habit that those five spots are filled on a consistent basis. Um, And then once you're able to do that, I think you move towards distributed practice, which is, 
you know, you do transition offense today, but then you don't touch upon it again until a day or two later. And now that's where the retrieval comes in. That's where real learning happens. That's what Doug taught me is like real learning happens right at the point of forgetting, almost forgetting something. Um, so, but what we do is, you know, and what I have a tendency of doing sometimes is you practice something for 15 minutes and then you get, you don't do it for the rest of practice. And then you come back to it again tomorrow for 15 minutes and you're not really building um, you're not really building that, you know, that knowledge for it, that habit for it. And then, so it doesn't stick. And then once something doesn't stick, you're not able to retrieve it as well. Um, you know, so I think constantly flowing in between mass and distributed practice is important. And then having the patience to stay with something until it becomes a habit. That, that's my, that's my weakness is like, I want to move on to the next thing. <laughs> I want to introduce the next concept. I want to, I want to make sure I get all this in this week. And I, and I just don't think that's how learning, you know, goes or right. teaching for that. Part. Would individual practice be similar? I think so. I mean, I think if you had an hour, you don't want to go over 10 different things because you're, you're, you're re-triggering the brain every six minutes to go over something different. And by, by the end of the 60 minute workout, you know, what has that player really become good at? And so you know, I think focusing on one or two things uh, is important. And then constantly, like we, like we talked about, how does it apply to the game? Like, it's easy to go through a drill, but if it's not game uh, applicable and it's not, he doesn't have the opportunity to understand how this is going to happen in the game and how to build a decision towards it, then it's going to be difficult for him to grasp that concept when he's in a live setting. Right. And I'm sure this is kind of an art, but how long do you, like, where would a player need to get in terms of familiarity for you to know how long to interleave before coming back to retrieve the that concept? I mean, it probably has a lot to do also with what Doug talks about, which I think is the game model and, and you know, how much you're going back. I think a lot of it has to do with um, your practice time, how much you're practicing. You know, we don't get as many practices during the year. So a lot of our reps are happening in the game. And mm. so, you know, it's a little bit different for us than it may be for high school or college. And, and, and you know, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know if there's a right answer to that. I think it's just a matter of knowing your team and, you know, how are you measuring your results? And so if you're talking about transition offense and we got to fill these five spots, I think what gets, what gets measured is, is kind of what gets talked about the most, what's important. And so if you're measuring spacing and you have 100 transition possessions in the next, in the last five games and you know you got into the right spacing 60 percent of the time more than the next five you got to get to an 80 percent and I think just measuring stuff and being able to see that will kind of show you if if it's being taught or not if it's being learned or not right right um and now I'm, I'm just thinking for you in terms of skill development, in terms of practice, there's obviously, I mean, Doug talks about it. There's four phases of the game. There's two different transitions. There's transition offense, transition de defense. Then you have offense and then you have defense. When designing practice and thinking about transferability, especially when it comes to team practice, how are you thinking in terms of developing drills if you're trying to hammer on say for example half court offense are you thinking of the phase that comes before um what you're trying to actually work on or the phase that comes afterwards how, how does that kind of process in your I, mean, I think you have to do both i think you have to you know work on both transitions you know half court set into defense and then defense into a half court set or whatever that phase may be so i think you have to attack it from both sides um and it can look different you know, each practice day. Uh, so that was really fun in summer league. Like, you know, we haven't, done, we haven't implemented the four phases of the game or a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now during an NBA season. I think you know, you have to work at that more, but during summer league, you know, our practice plans were built around the four phases. And so if we were working on transition defense, we were either working on half court um, offense before that, or we were working on the phase after transition. Like once your defense is set, now we move into you know, the next phase. And so I thought that was really fun for me as a coach. It really helped my planning. I think it really, it was fun for the players because they were playing more because we weren't just sitting in a half court going over a static drill. We were, okay, we're transition defense into secondary offense. And so it just made it I think, a lot more fun and they, they were able to see the game.
during are, practice, which sometimes can be hard. Are, are you making them aware of what you're doing um, before you're doing, like, are, are they, do they know what, what's going on in terms of like, okay, we're, I really want you to focus on offense here, but before this offense, we're, we're, we're going to really push the ball and then we, we find nothing, then this is, we're going to run this, I don't know, Spain actions, pistol, like whatever it is that you guys run. Are they yeah, man, I think, I think that's where we talked about before starting this was like, how do you create buy-in? I think you create buy-in with, with explaining the why, like this is why we're doing this. This is how it's going to help you become better. And this is how it's going to help us become better in the game. And so, you know, talking to them and saying like, transition defense is directly correlated to your offense here you mm -hmm. Shot selection, decision making, spacing, and so practicing only transition defense doesn't really simulate a situation in a game where you turn the ball over, you take a bad shot, your spacing is bad, and now there's three guys um, in the wrong place, and you have to get back on defense. So working on okay, we're going half court offense, two trips, half court offense, and then end it on transition defense allows them to kind of build small connections through you know, the game. And I think that really helps. I think guys like doing that. Mm. Um, you touched upon it because this was actually my next question of creating buy-in. And I think that, at, I mean, I would imagine at your level, it's something that is extremely important because you're dealing with unbelievably accomplished players who have played at all different levels and probably been successful since they were very young. What are some of the ways that you go about creating buy-in and you just mentioned that you know having the prior conversation about talking about how this is going to benefit them what what does it look like for you what kind of advice do you have for maybe coaches getting into the nba world um in terms of creating buy-in i mean i think it's i think it's a two-way street i don't think it can be um your way i think you have to have conversations you know the like players are just as smart as the coaches. I don't think, you know, we're not coaching because we're smarter than they are. We're coaching because we just want to help them. We want to guide them. And so creating ownership through accountability, um, create ownership through, you know, giving them a voice and be like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? You know, can this work? You're the ones that are playing. So we have to make sure we're on the same page that you're comfortable executing it. Um, here's my vision of why I think it can work with yours. And so I think those are a couple of things, ownership, accountability and then creating a space for for them to really have just as much of a say as you because at the end of the day they're the ones that have to execute it right what what kind of advice would you i mean what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is just entering the nba world and as a as a coach um what kind of advice would you i mean give your former self just starting as a coach in this league yeah i mean i think just being patient i think um You'll learn where you can have an effect. You'll learn, um, you know, where you'll be able to speak, where, where you won't be able to, how you can help a player. Um, so I think just being patient, uh, not trying to come in and be the smartest guy in the room or not trying to come in and, you know, and overtake something I think is important. And I think focus on relationships it, it, just as much, no matter what level, just as much of it is about, can do you know basketball is like, can you can you relate to people? Um, can you build relationships with them? Can you help them? Um, and can you be authentic? Now that you know everything that you know now, you have so much more experience. What's one piece of advice that you would give a college version of yourself who is playing today? Who, who would be playing? I, I focus on the, the, the mental aspect of the game. Okay. You know, I think I think when you have the ability to focus on the mental side of the game, understanding the why, um, understanding why things work, why they don't, uh, understanding how to separate yourself mentally, how to handle adversity, um, you know, how to handle different situations within the game. I think the, some of the best players are the ones that are able to really separate themselves mentally. Um, you know, they're able to control their emotions, they're able to control their environment, they're able to be, they're able to execute in, in different environments. They're able to bounce back faster from poor shooting nights or a poor playing game. And so as a player, for me, you know, I didn't really have the mental side of the game down pack. I didn't really put enough time into it. And what I'm learning now is, you know, the mental side of the game, I think, is is more important than the physical because of how many variables 
there are around you on and off the court. And I think the same goes for coaching too. Like, you know, coaching is nothing more than just, especially during a game, is nothing more than decision after decision. Um, when to call a timeout, when not to, what play to run, who to run it for, uh, diagnosing the situation, what are the matchups, how many timeouts you have left, what's the score. There's so much that you, you know, you have to be sharp um, and you got to kind of be in a free flowing state so that you can balance, you know, your instincts and decision making. Right. I think that's, I'm actually thinking about what you're talking about right now. That's, that's one of the things that's often overlooked in entire curriculum, an entire program, right? When working with players at any level. What is overlooked? The, sorry, the mental aspect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and, I, and I think, you know, it's hard because th there's a stigma that we have to get rid of that. Like, hey, if you were to tell someone, hey, you know, let's work on the mental side of the game there's nothing negative about that. It's, it's, it's a, it's a positive. Um, and even outside of basketball, I think, you know, a passion of mine is, is increasing mental performance and, and being able to have that conversation. You know, we have strength coaches. We go to the, to the weight room every day. We, we buy um, subscriptions to gyms, subscriptions to the Peloton, all kinds of stuff. And you got to make that same investment uh, for your brain, for your mindset, for your emotions. And it can have, to me, you know, doing that 30 minutes a day is almost just as powerful as getting on the Peloton or, or lifting weights. And so I think that's a huge piece to, you know, coaching um, and playing and really just anybody uh, in the world today. So you're touching on something that I'm actually very interested in getting into myself because I, I don't know a whole lot about it. When you say, say working 30 minutes on the mental aspect of the game, can you give us an example of something that you could do to work on that mental aspect? I think I think obviously film plays a part in that visualization. Okay. Um, I think visualization is key. I think just being aware. Um, you know why did you play bad? Um, you know why uh, didn't you feel? Why can you one game feel a certain way and play so well, and another game feel another way and not play so well? So kind of just digging into that. Um, you know, is there a correlation between free throw shooting and mindset? I think there is. You know, is there a correlation between shooting and mindset? Is there, um, you know, a correlation to, you know, shooting slumps, stuff like that? And so uh, you're on the road. You didn't get much sleep. How can you how can you navigate that into being the best version of yourself, regardless of the circumstances that you're in? And so I think a lot of that kind of plays into it. That's, that's very interesting now that, now that, I mean, you've got me thinking about this and then you can look at the nutritional component of say, you're putting the wrong food into your body and that affects like the hormones that you're releasing in terms of your mood and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I think it's a holistic approach into, you know, how can you be, and then I think that's what you're seeing a lot with athletes today is, you know, they're taking that holistic approach to becoming a better athlete. And it's not just about, you know, how good they are at their sport. Right, right. Well, Joe, you've been so generous with your time. The last question I have before we find out where we can get in touch with you, what is a successful career to Joe Mazzola? Uh, I mean, I think, number one, uh, kind of remaining true to myself, you know, as far as my faith, um, my wife, my two children. So just on a quest to be like the best without um, – losing that. And so I'm always going to err on the side of my faith and family, but at the same time, I'm on a constant quest to like, how great can I be? Um, you know, how much can I impact people? Um, you know, how much can I become a better teacher? So just constantly improving and improving for yourself, improving for the people around you, but at the same time, staying true to yourself, I think is important. Um, you know, I haven't won a championship yet. I, I did as a, uh, player but then as a coach and you know, the more I'm in it the more it's like you you do everything you can to do that but you know to what ex ex expense and um, you know I've kind of made a promise to myself that it's not going to be at the expense of my family or my faith but you know hopefully if I had the opportunity to win one we do amazing well thank you so much for your time just before we end you're I mean you're such a wealth of knowledge where can people find out more about you and all the awesome stuff that you got going on. I mean, I don't know. I don't have social media. I don't really like it. Um, so I don't know if they can find out about me, but 
my email is j uh, my last name m a z z u l l a number two number one at gmail and always open to helping people uh the best that i can and um you know if there's any questions or anything you know just email me and, and love to help any way i can Joe, I really appreciate you coming onto the show. I mean, you've been unbelievably generous and you're a busy guy. So I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for your time. Not that busy. We all have the same amount of time every day and everybody you know, has something important that they're doing. So I'm not that busy. All right. Thank you so much. Just hold the line for me.